now that we've learned just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to memory, we're going to launch into these three discrete stages of encoding, storage, and retrieval. And we're going to start off with encoding. So by encoding, we mean that you're attending to sensory information and converting the sensory information into stored memories. Now this can happen both explicitly and implicitly. We've, we've talked a lot about explicit and implicit learning and explicit and implicit consciousness. And so this still holds with this scenario here. It's the idea that you could be listening to this lecture right now and attempting to remember the content in a very explicit manner. And you are attempting to encode information. It could also be implicit stuff that you are starting to remember that you're not actually trying to remember. Background noises, the layout of your house, you might not put a lot of effort into it, but you are remembering it. Uh, it might be some things like little sound effects or how to navigate uh, parts of the browser on your computer. And so this is stuff that is just sort of almost intuitive seeming that you're not really putting a ton of effort into, but you are getting. So the explicit stuff is stuff we're more conscious of that we're actually voluntarily trying to learn versus the implicit is the stuff that just happens from experiencing. Now it's important to understand that encoding is limited. And one of the things it's mainly limited on is our cognitive load. We can only hold so much in our consciousness at once and it's impossible for us to try and encode everything happening. We know that we can only have certain things in our consciousness and even though some of it's getting through into our pre-consciousness and subliminally, we are not really encoding that in the most effective way. When you're trying to pay attention to too much, if there's too much going on, trying to remember and, and really carve this into stone in your mind's eye is going to be impossible. So it's the idea that if you are just overwhelmed, overstimulated, you're not going to be able to encode as well. Versus if things are more calm and it's a less overstimulating environment, you're going to have an easier task. Another thing to keep in mind is multitasking. We know that our consciousness will ping pong back and forth between two or more tasks that we're never truly doing two at once, even if it's measured in little tiny nanoseconds. And so when it comes to multitasking, it's important to understand you may not be encoding as effectively as you wanted. One of the reasons why texting while listening to class lectures is not considered ideal. So I like to think about encoding is when we're typing, when we're writing the stories of our memory in our mind, when we're carving or chiseling with slate is how I like to think about encoding, when you're really making those impressions. That being said, not all type of encoding is considered equal and we have to think about the different levels of processing. So when we go to encode things, if you're thinking about um, writing, well, do you press really lightly with pencil and barely be able to see it later on? Or do you carve this really hard with a big charcoal uh, pencil and it's very deeply seated in your mind's eye? Well, these represent the different levels of processing. And so these different types of encoding lead to different storage and retrieval options later on. And so we're gonna talk about these three layers. There's more shallow layers and deeper layers. Both structural and phonemic processing are considered relatively shallow versus semantic processing is considered deep. So we're gonna start off with structural processing or structural encoding. So structural processing is the idea that you are not putting a lot of effort into what you're attentive to, and you may actually not be that attentive to it. Uh, at the very surface level, this is really shallow processing. You're more passive, you're not deeply engaged, and you're just sort of moving and going with, going with the flow without actually putting in lots of effort. And so one of the ways I like to think about this is uh, if you're going to read a passage and your eyes move down the page, but at the end of the page, you have no recollection of what you just read. Immediately at the end of the page, you say, what was that? So your eyes were going and there was some sort of muscle happening and you remember seeing letters and you remember seeing the indentations and the spaces between the paragraphs and the shapes, but you don't recall the content. So this is the idea that I have a little example here of a sentence and it's the idea that you could recall some of the letters but when you look at it, it's just a jumbled mess. And so you are not going to retain that information you just read. You were inattentive to it in the first place and you're really only looking at the shapes of the letters and not, not what they are actually saying and not what they actually meant. So this is a very shallow level of processing. Another type of relatively shallow processing is called phonemic processing. And phonemic processing, phoneme means the sounds. So when we're talking about verbal processing, this is when you're paying attention to the sounds of language, but no longer the meaning of language. So this is the idea that it's still a very shallow surface level processing. This is the level I see a lot of university students stuck in. And you may be stuck in phonemic processing if you find yourself constantly rewriting notes, 
but never really putting the notes in your own words. And so I find there's a lot of students who they will take down everything a professor puts on a PowerPoint slide or everything a professor says verbatim, and they just constantly rewrite that and rewrite that and rewrite that. But in a new context, they cannot apply that knowledge. So what happens here phonemic processing is you are memorizing the word for word, but you have no idea what the words mean. And so I like to consider this a type of parroting back. You can parrot back exactly what it is, but you don't have a deeper knowledge of what's going on. So the sentence that I had on the previous slide for structural processing didn't really make sense. It makes a little bit more sense in phonemic processing. And remember, don't try and think about this at a higher level, just parrot it back. If everything is a mountaintop, then there would be no mountains at all. You might be able to say that, but not really understand what it means. To really understand what it means, we have to go to the deepest level of processing, and this is semantic processing. Semantic processing is when we can think about it, take it out of context. Don't just copy the notes, put the notes into your own words. And so understand what it is. So we think about that mountain example. Now we can think if there, everything was a mountaintop, there'd be no mountains at all. What does that mean? How could there be no mountains if everything was a mountaintop? Well, perhaps one of the things it could mean is without having the bottoms of a mountain, the tops would not be high up. The mountain tops are only top because they're relative to the bottoms. And if there was no diversity in height or altitude, then there would not be any altitude at all. And so that's just one interpretation. You could, you could take that in many different ways. But semantic processing is the idea that you are starting to get it. It's deeper. So the way to do semantic processing is if you're reading a passage, rather than letting your eyes go over it, but your mind's not there, or rather than just memorizing everything at the surface, you have to pause at the end of every sentence. What does this mean? How do I think about this in my own life? How can I connect this to something? And when you pause after every sentence or after every paragraph in your reading, what you are doing is elaboration. So elaboration is when we associate information with something else in our brain. This is a core part of semantic processing. To do semantic processing, we find that we typically either associate it with other things we know. Oh, I just read this in a paragraph. This connects to something that was in the previous paragraph. Or this makes me understand things from an earlier chapter. Or you can be self-referent with it. When you read something in a paragraph, if it's about psychology or it's about math or it's about science, you can say, oh, this is how it applies to my everyday life. Or I can think of an everyday example about this. That can also help us with deep, deeper processing. And a final example could be visualizing. Not looking at the visuals that are given to you per se, but thinking about your own visualizations, thinking about how you'd interact with this in everyday life. We know that Einstein was a big visualizer when it came to the theory of relativity, and so this helped him to understand those abstract concepts because he can make them more concrete through the visuals in his mind. And so elaboration is the idea that you are now going to strengthen your retrieval cues. You don't just have this one isolated fact in this one isolated chain of synapses that you have to pair back exactly how it appears. Now you understand it in a deeper way. And by understanding it in a deeper way, the amount of synaptic pathways, the amount of neurological connections you have to this idea has increased. And your ability to retrieve that memory is going to be strengthened. And so you're more likely to be successful in comprehending and applying this to new contexts and new scenarios. So this is a really core part of really deeply understanding things.